Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, friends and colleagues from across the world. Thank you for joining today's Podinar session, the second session of the day. We had two yesterday. Um, today we have a special guest with us that I will be introducing shortly in detail, Dr. Mike Elvis Calderon. Thank you for joining us, doctor. Hey, how are you there? <laughs> Many you guys do the <laughs> yes, your <laughs> signature, your signature mark, definitely. Um, I'm going to do a more detailed introduction Oops, of Mike uh, once we get uh, a little bit further into the podinar. A couple of housekeeping announcements. I wanted to thank you, uh, uh, all of the organizing members that are uh, in the in the background, caring and sharing. Um, between the projects of last year and this year, we have clocked in more than 3,000 hours of free time between world-leading speakers, organizers, all doctors that are in the business of maximizing information exchange for our colleagues without any barriers, uh, um, such as having to register somewhere, or be part of a membership or pay anything. We bring these speakers to uh, uh, help other doctors, help other patients. So our hope is that our efforts will lead to the care of uh, uh, millions of patients through our colleagues by uh, maximizing information exchange. With that said, uh, Dr. Calderon, I'm gonna briefly read your uh, bio. Hey doc, I got a little bit of a, a, a breakage in your, in your stream. Uh, we see you a little bit, and then it goes away. Me? Yeah, there, there. That's better now. There you go. That's that? perfect. Uh, that's perfect. I think the stream is a little uh, weak on both of our ends, but we'll make it work. So, Implant Mike, you guys see him all over the place, in different groups, in different uh, academics, in different conferences. Who is this man behind... Uh, all of these efforts. So Dr. Calderon, AKA Implant Mike, I've received his degree at Case Western Reserve University School of Dentistry, class of 1994 in Ohio. Uh, he returned to New York to complete his GPR at Kings Co County Hospital. Uh, Dr. Mike, as he is commonly called, continued on with his training in implant dentistry at the New York Implant and Prosthetic two-year program, then again for another two years at the United States Dental Institute for a certification in orthodontics. Um, wow, I didn't know you also are into ortho. And he's certified in uh, platelet-rich plasma, PRP, for facial aesthetics and non-surgical facelifts. Dr. Mike has an extensive educational background and experience in implant dentistry. He uh, went on to become a board-certified implantologist and is currently a diplomat of the American Board of Implantology, diplomat of the International Congress of Oral uh, Implant Dentistry, um, and fellow of the American Academy of Implant Dentistry. It's so basically just about every title that matters in the implant world. Uh, he was the surgical director and clinical instructor at New York CDE program for implantology and prosthetics for over 10 years. So he is also in private practice in New York, uh, in two different locations, and uh, he provides advanced surgical and prosthetic uh, care. Um, not only has he founded the Calderon Institute for hands-on training for, for our colleagues, but also Doc has uh, has uh, 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 brought together a wonderful family that we uh, all love to see uh, uh, as he uh, does his postings. So basically, he has done everything very well in life, and uh, we can uh, learn quite a bit from him. On top of all of this, there is the Mike humor that comes with all of the education and training and everything else that everyone loves. Uh, we're very honored to have you, Dr. Calderon, uh, um, to talk to us today about uh, 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 PRP and uh, uh, GBR and those things that are becoming not important only in implantology, but various facets of surgical procedures in the dental uh, uh, facial space. Um, so please tell us, what is your motivation behind all of this? What is your goal? What are you trying to accomplish, doctor? You know, Kevin, first I want to thank you guys. You know, it's, it's always, you know, you did great because I remember when you first got 
fantastic job. I love the work together and just uh, works on people. You know, something that, that all of us spoke up and no one stepped forward for. So <laughs> that's the first thing. You know what? It's it's funny. You know, I get older. Uh, I remember now I grew up ago, and uh, literally ago you learn what you want to learn. Hey, Doc, sorry, things. you're you're Continue. getting really bad a uh, 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 feed. Uh, you're cutting out. We can't hear you real well. Um, it's cutting out. We didn't get your message. Uh, maybe in the location oh. we were earlier at. Uh, 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 you want to try that? Yeah. No, it's not. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we can. Uh, let's hang on till we till we can hear you clear, so the audience can uh, um, can absorb the message that you have. Okay. A yeah, I heard the last part. Yeah, that's better. That's well, a little bit better. Yeah. Tell me. Yeah, I can hear you, yeah. but you're still cutting out a little bit. It stops the stream. How's that? Everything off and. Okay? No, it's cut. I can't, your stream is not going. I think the internet is not uh, strong. Not that great on my side. There you go. Let's see. Uh, yeah, that's better. That's better. That works. <laughs> Implant mic. Back in the house. <laughs> okay, I'll leave. <laughs> that's it. Now, okay, <laughs> where we st started off is what is your motivation, Doc, for doing all of these things, bringing a wonderful family together? helping countless patients, countless doctors, setting up associations and organizations and all the stuff that you do. Tell us. Oh, gosh. It's not, you know what, the honor. It's, uh, it started off crazy. Uh, back, I graduated in 94, all right? And uh, the case was, as you said beforehand, and I started going to school, teaching, and just kind of love for dentistry. And it's because you don't really realize much of it. You actually do it, you know. You know, it just kind of grows on you. And then also uh, having five daughters, you know, five, <laughs> they got to have some kind of role model to follow. But none of them want to be dentists. Oh. None of them want to be dentists. Oh. So I don't know what <laughs> medical school or something. Because they're... <laughs> She's back there. Surgeon. That's my daughter. Surgeon. <laughs> 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 Those are my twins. They're going to be going to uh, college next year. So uh, they're uh, looking forward to that. But anyway, you know, when I was at NYU teaching implantology over there, and that's when my whole road started. It was uh, the old going through university, and you know how that is. You know, so much going through things that uh, I created my own ins. And what's funny was that one day I asked if I could lecture. And uh, I was rambunctious, crazy, loud. So I think that uh, that kind of scared the uh, higher ups. <laughs> so I said, all right, I'm going to start my own institute. That way I can always lecture. And that's what happens. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're here. So we're here. And, uh, you know, I've been teaching a lot of people ever since. And, uh, you know, the two ways go, uh, the wrong and the right way. So we did the right way. And then hopefully they'll go forward and do things for people. Sure, that's a very good approach. And yes, there's always hires up. So it's sad that uh, that uh, when somebody steps up, that would uh, disturb their national uh, flow. But it's all about education and training. Doctors respect people that uh, that uh, uh, try to uh, expand uh, knowledge uh, for everyone, uh, versus um, creating barriers to trade, as you know. And usually, the people that are expanding knowledge for everyone else tend to win uh, any kind of uh, any kind of debates but it's good you made your own and now you have the calderon institute you travel i understand to other countries and you, you teach uh, hands-on courses there and and what have you is that correct yeah that came with a lot of help from other people other institutions other organizations like uh, i have a lot to thank for the aaid the icoi of that nature that supported me during that and uh, yeah, they're great organizations. So 
you know, this animal you see in front of you is a, is a making of a lot of people. <laughs> but um, those organizations, they were great and they helped tremendously to uh, spread the good, the good word of dentistry and implantology. That's and it. As you can see, I'm Stephen Browns. <laughs> You bring uh, laughter and fun into the whole equation. What is your position on that? Uh, why do you think that laughter and fun uh, uh, is important in education and dentistry and medicine and healthcare? Oh, it's, it's like uh, you, you get more attention, just like video, you know, you get more attention when you have fun, you learn more when you have just creating the same mundane thing over and over and over again. So it's like I want to be the Xbox of implantology. Xbox, sure. <laughs> you, you be fantastic, not me. You, look at you. <laughs> it's our duty as uh, as professionals to uh, to contribute uh, uh, to to the profession in a positive kind of way. But yeah, I've been following your work for many years, and uh, it was an honor to have you on. You. Uh, really inspiring to many many people and uh, every time I turn around uh, everyone has nothing but positive things to say about implant Mike oh, you're, you're too kind thank you so doc uh, uh, your friend. emphasis you went from general dentistry to from adjusting dentures and doing fillings to implants and then you got into into, into uh, all of these different advanced advanced uh, skills you know, there is about 120 million plus Americans that suffer from edentialism or similar uh, and that need implants. And there's only about a million or two implants placed a year for over 500 million missing teeth. Um, a lot of dentists are scared or only about 10% of them are placing implants. Um, can you tell us what your idea is and how we can improve that number and tackle this silent epidemic that essentially affects over 2.5 billion uh, uh, patients across the world. You know, I, one of it is uh, not just, it's even uh, meaning like everything that comes in sometimes as a, when we're and coming out a dentist, we're afraid you know, to properly uh, speak and promote in dentistry. So unfortunately, because those dentists that have not followed through at the curve, didn't to how can I say, um, educate the patient about implantology. The patient just goes and think they're dead. Now, no one passed away eight years ago, okay? And uh, there was what I tried to prove. You know, had 17 implants in his, in, you know, in his head, and mom didn't have any. And what took dad was, uh, you know, dad suffered from dementia, so. You know, that's a natural course of life. But he was eating everything. <laughs> and mom, who had wits and a denture, but because she's in, at the early, uh, early age of 80, she couldn't implant me because of medic, uh, medically compromised. So she suffered health. health. So it was a perfect example of what it can do for you, implants, not what implants can do. So I think that's that's a big driver now when I speak to people. I let them know my mom and dad. That's, uh, that's very nice. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, uh, that was a uh, uh, great uh, analogy. V. I think that what you're doing, if more and more doctors were doing what you're doing, you could actually tackle this problem on a, on a worldwide scale. There's just simply not enough specialists, oral surgeons, periodontists to care for all these patients. And uh, you have to step up to the plate because if you get the proper training, we can all do it. Um, not just ten percent of us, and it's the hottest thing in dentistry right now. You know the implant, the implant sphere and business, and it's a great um, career advancement opportunity for all of our colleagues. But Mike, we we are really appreciative of you coming on and uh, and bringing your expertise and knowledge, and I think that you will motivate many others to do so. You're also on top of the million things that you do. Um, uh, I have two kids. I don't know how you do five, but uh, and five daughters as a, as, a, as a man that's uh i presume that makes you uh, a lot stronger than me <laughs> because i have one daughter and that's a handful oh. and <laughs> you plant dentistry the divas so i i spoke to that but 
started having an army membership. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> so with that basically, Doc, I uh, won't take any more of your time here to get into the presentation. What we would like to do is um, you will have the... Could you open up your presentation uh, and send it through for me, please? One more time. There it is. Let's go ahead and put it on. It's on. It disappeared uh, again, Mike. We are having some technical difficulties here. Go ahead and open that one more time for me, please, and I'll bring it into the stream. There it is. How's that? It's perfect. How's that? The floor is yours, Doc. Okay. Okay. Hey everybody, Implant Mike here. I uh, hope you can see me. I can't see myself. Uh, I tend to speak fast, so I'll go slow. Uh, my whole objective here is to let every general just know that you can, you should be doing implants and incorporating PRF and GBR into your practice every day uh, will not only give your patients the quality of life they deserve, but also uh, help you in your practice be different from everyone else and advance you to where we should be. So let me go forward here. So once again, my name is Mike, not Michael. So call me Mike, M-I-K-E, or call me Mikey. Mikey is fine. I'm going to show you a case presentation, but a couple of cases. So I'm going to go kind of uh, slow, fast. You let I guess you guys will step in and let me know how I'm doing. I have a little timer going on. That way I know how much time I have left. So these are just, uh, this is one case I'm going to show you here. And the aim of this presentation, I'm not going to read all this, but uh, like I just told you, how we're going to have to incorporate PRF into our everyday life. You should do it. I'm going to let you know about the financial benefits, all right? And the one thing I learned in Perio was that any procedure you do should be obviously positive and reproducible, okay? If it's reproducible, it's in the literature, that means it's a good thing, all right? Not what you do in your office. Um, because what I do in my office, I dance around a lot. So I don't know if a lot of people know how to dance. Um, and the other thing is you have to learn, eventually you'll do a PRF maybe once a month. Uh, then it'll go to once every two weeks, then once a week. And eventually you'll start doing it two or three times, you know, a week. And eventually do it every day. All righty. And when you incorporate every day, that's when the return on your investment comes in. And your investment it's not only money, but it's time. You become better, you will learn how to treat patients better and give them a better outcome and a better quality of life. Okay, uh, platelet-rich fiber and fold dentists. All right, uh, this was uh, basically uh, PRF is the second step to PRP. And, you know, don't I speak, how can I say, uh, without practice, so sometimes I'll stutter. And what happens here is I'll say something. If you want to correct me, you can. All right. But uh, PRF, the fiber matrix, which is containing all these beautiful macrophages and stem cells, and it, they proliferate, they become, they differentiate to our soft tissue, angiogenesis, everything that we need that's wonderful for healing. This is what it looks like. So those of you who have seen it, uh, seen it on videos, on YouTube, on my Facebook, uh, you will see this and, you know, it looks like a grape, <laughs> a peeled grape. It feels like sushi. And, you know, once you start working with it, it will become second nature. So what's PRF? PRF, all right? It's the next step after PRP, like I just told you. PRP was wonderful because I remember when I was first learning about it with um, Jim Rutowski. Oh, that was back in, in early 2000s. PRP was fantastic. But the one thing with PRP, it's a bolus. Uh, when you use it, it lasts for a short amount of time, unlike PRF, which has that matrix and allows you to, allows the material and all those growth factors to stay in the area for a few days. They call it LPRF, LPRF because of the leukocytes. That's what makes it different from PRP. We can use PRF as a membrane, right? So, if you want the, the financial part comes in here, you could use a barrier membrane as you had the lecture beforehand. There are several barrier membranes like uh, the doc mentioned before and they're non-resorbable and resorbable. Obviously PRF will be resorbable, but it's not a complete barrier membrane like uh, 
biome and extend or mem or amniotic uh, chorion, uh, membrane. So you have to know when to use it. So that's where your training comes in. Next, uh, you can use it for blood clots, variety. And I actually, uh, Dr. Nelson Pinto, another good friend of mine who uh, basically uses, he's another master of PRF. And Nelson Pinto told me how he used it. He gives lectures all the time on uh, how they use PRF on burn victims. And then, what? not a wonderful story, but a, a great story that he had was that his wife had burned herself. And she's the one that told him, well, if you use PRF on, on the horses, why can't you use it on me and you know, help I eat my burn? So he did, and it worked out fantastic. And he actually used these photos for his lecture. I speak of him because he's a great friend, but burn sites. So what happened with burn sites, one of the, um, the receptions in my office, she came with a severe burn mark on the cheek. How did she get that? She got that by uh, a curling iron. So before using the sun or anything, I said, uh, let's put some PRF on there and help you out with it. And that way she doesn't scar. It looks fantastic. So PRF, even for curling iron victims. <laughs> uh, what else? PRF basically has everything that's good in the blood, but it's in the concentrated mode. So how can I say that? Base, think about watered down coffee, and now you have an espresso. OK? Before I go to the next, okay, this is important to me because um, you just don't learn these things. Dentistry and implant dentistry is, is about sharing your knowledge and sharing uh, your information. And, and when you get together with people and just talk, and you can speak to the oral surgeons because they're fantastic, the periodontists are fantastic, um, you know, prosthodontists, all our specialties, if you work well together, you'll just learn so much, okay? And the best thing about, about speaking to these, all these specialists is you learn how to advance. At the same time, what's most important is you know what not to do, okay? That's the biggest thing. So in other words, if somebody comes in with a broken jaw, I'm not going to do this. That belongs to the oral surgeon, all <laughs> right? So, but at least you can, you, you know what your limitations are. That's the most important. So these are my educators. That's my brother, all right? And that's me before he got my veneers. And uh, what my brother and I, uh, we always we always travel together. It's my brother Marcelo, Dr. Marcelo, he's another dentist, also an implantologist, and we travel together all the time. So anybody, uh, if you like me, you're gonna love Marcelo, all right? But he's my inspiration in this, and you know he always keeps me going. Next is this group from the AAID, the American Academy of Implant Dentistry. You know Jason Kim right there. He's a great brother, friend of mine. And you got Richard and Adam there. They're all, all great people. So you learn from these people here. They make you a better person inside. You know, Mike here, he's fantastic also. So another periodontist will help you out. Just kind of talk to people and get to know people. Lenny was one of my, learned, my early mentors. And I learned a lot from Lenny. And, of course, the great Carl Mish, okay, who was also a great dear friend who knew my brother and myself really well. So let's go forward. All right. The major differences between PRF and PRP, right? And these are the three things. I'm not going to read all this because you can read. <laughs> all right. So the main the main thing is that PRF it lacks anticoagulants. What does that mean? That means it coagulates. Okay. It doesn't lack it completely. It just coagulates. So that's why you get this matrix, this jelly-like uh, substance. The second thing, it contains leukocytes. All right, which helps us with infection. So it helps prevent any kind of bacterial infection going into our surgical sites. Doesn't mean that it's going to prevent it 100%, but it does mean it's going to help tremendously. The fantastic part about PRF is when I use it in my sinuses, um, I probably do, I'm going to guess maybe about maybe 40 to 50 sinuses a year. Um, and, you know, I remember before using PRF, I would probably have maybe maybe one failure or one complication a year. I can't tell you when's the last time I had a complication. Okay, I'm going to say it's got to be at least five years ago because the more you use it, the better you'll get at it. So PRF just kind of helps everything you do. Uh, there was one time I did not use PRF, probably about seven years ago and in my sinus lift. And I remember this case because the patient came back with complications two or three years later. I added PRF to the site. I cleaned it out and I added to the site inside the sinus. And amazing, you know, it healed. But obviously, you have to use the right antibiotics also because you have to help the patient out. The third thing, cytokines, okay? 
These are all the wonderful growth factors that PRF offers. That's amazing. So those are the three things, okay? It's minimal anticoagulants. That's why it becomes a matrix. That's leukocytes, cytokines, okay? Which basically you have your growth factors in there. Now, early in PRF, I remember this. I mean, I don't know what the books say, but I remember personally speaking, I was being attacked by a lot of specialists as to why I was using PRF because it doesn't help bone augmentations. Today, it proves that it does help the uh, bone grafting procedures succeed. And why? And the genesis, right? You need plumbing, okay? Things don't heal without blood. So with the early laying down of plumbing, which is blood vessels, you will get a proper healing, okay? The uh, new book that came out about three years ago with uh, Rick Myron and Joseph Shukron, uh they were the editors, editors of this, and uh, it was it's a wonderful read. You got to look at it. You want to learn about uh, PRF. That, that's a good book to read. And Joseph was a gentleman that I met probably about 15 years ago now. And obviously, he's older. But, uh, you know, a good man. A good man to meet. And uh, Rick, he's just a tall guy. Whenever you meet him, I'm only 5'8", so he's got a, I don't know how tall he is. But all I know is that my, my head was at his chest. <laughs> okay? Very tall guy. Very likable, likable guy. Nice guy. So meet them. Enjoy it. What is PRF? Uh, just a quick little video. Uh, this picture out of that book, okay, from Rick Myron and Joseph Chacron, and that's the way it breaks down with, you have uh, the PPP on top, you got the fibrin clot in the middle, and then you have your red cells on the bottom, okay, after your centrifuge. There are different rates of centrifuge to get your PRF or your LPRF, and everything comes out in the books that they'll tell you certain speeds are right, other speeds are wrong, what's best, you know, you do what you think is best. Uh, I follow whatever the literature tells me what's been proven. And um, slower speeds, slower centrifuge uh, speeds is uh, best. But this is uh, it. The normal human blood clot contains about 95% uh, red blood cells. 95%, that means 5% of platelets, okay? At the centrifuge, it's the opposite. So just imagine having that espresso coffee like I told you. It, it's... Uh, it's all full of platelets in there, and that's what we need for healing. It contains that fiber matrix I told you, and this all is in the read. Okay, so you need this for F to place in all your surgical procedures, soft tissue, heart tissue, so forth. Before we start, you have to remember what happens. Okay, you have to remember this, right? Failure is gonna happen in anything you do, especially if you're not trained properly. So you need to be trained, right? And trained by anyone who's advanced in PRF implantology and has experience and follows the literature. You need to follow the literature at all times. What really happens, this is what happens, okay? Yeah, you know, and what did this kid learn from that fence? There's one, either uh, don't jump over fence, <laughs> a fence, okay, be careful. And, you know, don't jump over things that you can't handle. That's my whole thing. Don't get into something you cannot handle get trained for it, okay? There's sometimes that, you know, it's just gonna hit the fan. Things go wrong, and you have to be prepared to handle all complications. You can't just go and do something and then all of a sudden not know how to get out of it when you're in trouble. The next thing is don't think. Okay, things go wrong. You're pulling teeth. This is what happens. Yeah. Okay. Things go wrong. So I needed to show that video because when things go wrong, when you see pus come on or pralines coming out, uh, you know, you panic. You panic. Uh, you have to change your underwear sometimes because you panicked, but you have to make sure that everything goes well and know how to get out of it. Okay. Okay, the application for PRF. I said I was going to do a case study here, so that's why I wanted to uh, dwell on that. I didn't want to do anything. Oh, let me just put this here. Sorry, excuse me. I didn't want to uh, just give you a lecture on the science behind it. Uh, I just don't find, I mean, you can read on the science. I can read the science to you, but we're here to learn, okay? And you should be doing the reading. All right, soccer preservation. All right, I do a lot of soccer preservation, but I like placing my implants immediately. That's probably about 
I would say 80% of my implantology is immediate placement. And what happens here is that a case like this comes in and the gentleman was there for, I believe he was this way for three years when I first saw him. And it looks like it's not restored. It looks like you can restore it. But if you look at it properly, I would have to do crown lengthening. I would have to do, this is a case before I did the crown actually on number five. And if you have to do crown lengthening, I'm going to, you know, change the anatomy of the bone around the molar. So you have to start thinking ahead. Think, think like an implantologist. Oh, somebody's calling me. <laughs> and what happens is that uh, in this case, look how long the root is. Don't be intimidated by the size of the root. Remember, size doesn't matter. Okay. And, uh -huh. and then what happens is, you know, my objective here was to get that tooth out save the gingival architecture okay so we can have good aesthetics and go forward with an implant placement so i can retain the volume of the area and in all this i always add prf next it's all my graphs okay all my graphs are basically is whatever you're going to put on the ridge all right it's guided bone regeneration so to give you a case a patient like this comes in with a screw in the, in the middle of their uh in their vestibule area you know, you know what this is already. If those of you don't know, it's called a tenting screw. So somebody attempted or they did place a bone graft there, an onlay graft, and they placed a tenting screw so that you can hold the graft up. Uh, but what happens is that you typically lose 50% of that bone if it's not properly done, and the tent comes right through, okay? The tenting screw, and that's what happened here. But uh, this is the case actually I'm gonna show you, both these cases. And then PRF also is used in sinus lifts. Like I said, 40 to 50 sciences a year, and PRF has just been goal to my practice. And this is basically, if you look at this photograph here, not only do I have a sinus, but I also have resorption of the ridge right by the canine. So at the same time, I added PRF to the sinus, PRF to the bone graft, I mean, to the ridge, to protect the root there of the canine. So I don't, well, we're gonna go over that. Uh, sinus lifts are a whole different lecture. All these are different lectures and you have to go slowly. The setup of PRF, important. We have here, I have a lot to show you. So this is a basic setup for PRF. You're gonna have the plates, the weighted plates, the test tubes, I'm sorry, the, uh, the tubes for collecting the blood samples and so forth, the centrifuge. And I always like to set up the proper amount or the amount of anesthetics I'm gonna use. So I always have 10 out there, okay? Centrifuge. They're going to be different companies telling you that the best, like I said, you know, the end result after a month, they all look the same to me. So that's, that's what it is. But then again, I've done so many. If something's not looking right, I'll do PRF again. Uh, the use of PRF, once you have the whole system, it only costs like $20 for every setup. It's nothing. Okay. Where you go buy a membrane, it's going to cost you 80 bucks. So, and not only that, the arm, the blood is full of PRF. So you can always go after it a few times while you're working on any procedure. So I personally uh, use four different centrifuges. These are the ones I have pictures of, so I use that. Salvin, Salvin over here in the United States is always a great place to get it also. Uh, you need to know your anatomy. You're not gonna just stick a needle in somebody's neck and draw blood. So this you can find on YouTube. You can find this anywhere just to find out the anatomy, but you should take a phlebotomy course or any kind of course that incorporates uh, drawing a blood, okay? Uh, we do. Our institute, the Caldon Institute, uh, does incorporate phlebotomy in our courses. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of videos on this. This is actual videos from our practice. And just to show you quickly how they go, is the videos there. And I'm actually doing this kind of quick. I'm doing it in the wrong position so you can see with the camera. Attention there, draw it. And dentists typically don't draw blood. So this they kind of get a little scared or apprehensive about doing it. Uh, you can watch all the videos you want, but uh, I always compare uh, drawing blood to kissing. You know, if you don't practice, now, you're not going to get better. Now, you that we only need a little less this time? Only gonna... So it's just different cases. You know what happens if you miss the, the, uh, the vein? You miss. We do it again. And you keep on doing it again. And eventually, you won't do it so many times. Remember the bore, the, the angle of the bore has to be open to, to the top. You go in about a 30 degree angle, and you wait till it, uh, there's a little a splash there, and then a, a little flash, and then you, uh, you draw the blood. And it's great for the assistants because 
they feel they're, they're all getting you know involved in a procedure. While you're doing a procedure, while they're spinning the blood, I'm doing the sinus or the dry or, or preparing the site. So it's all uh, how can I say control times. Somebody's around. Sorry. As we go forward, I'm going to show you a little bit more. I see I'm, I'm, I'm already running time here and more blood, more videos, more pictures. So I'm going to go a little fast on this. Um, I like to look at the tube so I can see where the blood is being drawn. So I saw a video one time of another doctor showing how uh, he turns the tube this way so he can draw the blood. Then he turned it upside down or sideways. Oh, let me get, hold on. Apologies, I had to get my power cord. Okay, let's go forward again. Yes? Good. After we draw the blood, we centrifuge. I showed you a uh, two different centrifuges beforehand. This is a metafuge. I have one of the other practice. And then you go forward. This is the way the PRF looks. Um, we have our, um, can I say, you see a little globule up there? That's how I made it. Cut off the red blood cells. Now, I used to scrape the blood cells off there. And then when I spoke to Rick Myron and all, I said, don't scrape that off because that's where the most concentrated platelets uh, and growth factors are at, right at that border between your red blood cells and the matrix, okay? The PRF. So don't rub all the blood off. If there's a little bit of blood there, like you see here, it does not matter. Okay. But obviously, get most of it off because the other stuff is useless. So, do not roll off because you're re removing most of the um, platelets. That's the way it looks. Okay, it looks, it feels like chicken skin. It's pretty tenacious. Oops. While I'm doing my procedure, after I drew the blood, the uh, assistants and the staff, they, what they do is they start mixing everything up, the bone, along with um, the blood products there. So they get involved. Everybody gets involved in the practice, so that way the patient gets the benefits of us being efficient. This is what it looks like, okay? So it comes out nice and thick. It looks like a, you know, a little sticky bone can always be a little reddish. Um, so you can manip manipulate it well. Now that I just gave you a little rundown about PRF, which I think you know what it is already, now I'm going to show you the case they walked in. So this is back in September 15th. I'm sorry, September 15th, 2015. 48-year-old patient, we're talking about five years ago, so today she's 53 or 52. And what happens here is she's 48 years old. This is a typical case presentation, okay? Health is all within normal limits. That means I don't have to worry about uh, medical being, being medically compromised, sorry. She is a smoker, okay? But a lot of patients are, and they don't tell you they are. So especially today with cannabis, they don't consider cannabis smoking, so I don't know. So you gotta be careful what you ask and what they say. Uh, everybody has a couple of drinks, um, so you gotta be careful with that. No allergies. Now, this is the key here. When a patient comes in, I, you, need to know, you need to know how to read the patient, okay, but not just by the exterior. I'm the fourth dentist that she came to see for this, and this is the case I showed you about the only with the tensing screw. So if I'm the fourth dentist, why is she coming to see me? Not because I'm Mike or implant Mike. She's coming to see me because she's either trying to haggle, she's trying to find a, she's trying to find the answers that she wants to hear, not the answer that you want to give. So you have to be careful in how you handle this. So you tell them what you read in the literature, what you know. And this is the case. We know this already. This is the tenting screen. 
I want, I want you to see the video so you can just see how the tenth screw looks inside. I took the video myself, sorry, so it was one hand holding the lip and the other hand taking a video. But tenth screws are typically about 10 millimeters long. That's kind of the average of what we use. We want to over uh, build the, the surface of the, the ridge so that we can consider a little resorption of the bone. But it's all about the tension of the tissue. Have you ever heard? It's all about, I forgot what this phrase says about the tissue. <laughs> okay. But this is the plan. Uh, when, if you're going to do a bone graft or any kind of implant dentistry, you're going to premedicate. No matter what, you should premedicate. This is what I was taught. This is what I was trained with. You premedicate no matter what. Um, whether you're going to take antibiotics afterwards depends on the procedure. If you're grafting, then you're going to, you're going to give medication for the duration of seven to 10 days. If you're not grafting, you're just placing a simple, a simple implant, then you don't have to medicate after that. Seven days, because I know I'm doing a ridge graft. Know the ending before you start. A gentleman by the name of uh, Spiro Kondo, so men why you, when I'm taking my course, if Spiro's watching this, Spiro, thank you. I'll always remember that when you, ta when you taught me. Um, you know, know the ending before you start. Motrin 800 and acetaminophen or Tylenol, all right? This I learned from a friend of mine who is an obstetrician, and she told me that this was back like 15 years ago before everybody started realizing, hey, let's stay away from narcotics, um, that we use, I'm sorry, I said Morin. It's Motrin, Motrin 800 or Advil and acetaminophen 1,000 milligrams. You use these together bef uh, before they leave the office so that they're still numb, and pain is a chemical. Okay, for those general dentists that don't, or any dentist that doesn't uh, know about, uh, or doesn't follow the pharmacology well, or you kind of just forget, uh, what happens is pain is a chemical. So you want to stop the chemical before it's released. Because right? once the chemical's in the system, it has to you know, go its pathway and get eliminated. So it's better to prevent it than to get rid of it. Pain, we're talking about. Now, if you want to go through the COX inhibitors, COX inhibitor one, COX inhibitor two, one motion works on one, time works on the other, you eliminate both uh, inhibitors and pain relief, okay? In this case, I use something called a dentist implant. It's an older system. Um, you know, I have to tell you which one implant I use. I do not um, promote any implant system, so you use whatever you feel comfortable with and whatever the literature says works. At this time of my life, I was using dentists a lot, okay? And now I don't, <laughs> okay? Why? Because of their uh, problems with my office, I guess. Sorry, I had to say that. Uh, then I planned a two-stage procedure here. Why? Because I'm going to do a graft, and I want the soft tissue to heal. Once the soft tissue heals, I can manipulate the soft tissue so that I can place my implant and have the best aesthetic result. This is in the area of number seven and 10, or the anterior area. If it was number 31 or number two or three, it doesn't matter, okay? So we'll hold. Then over here, uh, I can't see behind this, so let's see what's going on. The tenting screw, I already explained to you as to what happened here, so I'd like to show videos again. I hope I look long, let's find out how this goes. But I need you to appreciate this video. If you can see this, you can see where the, ridge, the original ridge was and where the grafting material is at. And you can see the screw, if it's 10 millimeters long, it lost about 50 to 55, maybe 60% of the And this is it. What do you see here? That's the graft that they placed. That's the graft. Okay, I need you to appreciate that. So if you look at that width of that ridge, can you still place an implant? No, you can't. The patient also, I need to show you this. The patient came in, she wanted me to re remove the screw. Don't remove things without uh, having a plan because if you remove it, she's just gonna leave and go somewhere else and you're gonna be liable for whatever happens. So make removing of that screw part of your treatment plan that you're gonna remove it the day of treatment. So incision design. The plan is even though they have a lot of connective tissue, we want to keep that connective tissue. The wider the connective tissue, the better it is for the implant, especially in the aesthetic area. I like to compare the, the connective tissue or keratinized tissue like a Ziploc bag. We need a wide Ziploc bag. This is the incision design, all right? I learned this from 
medical actually. Okay, from a medical from cosmetic surgery of the face and all that. Not that I had anything done, not yet at least, but uh, what happens is that this is an incision designed so that you can advance tissue or pull it up. This is what it looks like. As you can see, I spared the papilla. I did not go into the sulcus because whenever you go into the sulcus, you make a sulcular incision, you're going to have some resorption. If you have resorption of the soft tissue, you have resorption of the bone. So we don't want to make these teeth longer. And try to keep the papilla when possible. So these are the two dots I'm showing you right now, okay? And this is the whole uh, point behind advancing tissue. The red point advances coronally, as you see in the video. And then from there, uh, you avoid the sulcus, as I said before, and papilla sparing. And you have to do a palatal incision, okay, because I want all that connective tissue or keratinized tissue to come from the palate area. And a periosteal release of a, a tendon free closure. That means that when you add to the bone, we need to account for that space, that volume. So I have to do a periosteal release. This is it. Everybody should be doing this in practice. You all be doing this. I remember when I was learning this, they were like, oh no, you can't do that. You can do this, right? Anybody can look at that tension free. When you have no tension on a bone graft area, as you heard Dr. Pan, you know, she was fantastic in the presentation, by the way. Uh, Pavel, you did a great job. Uh, the other thing is that no tension, no mic movement, that bone is going to heal. When they did this tension, uh, this tenting screw, I'm assuming that. They didn't release anything there, and that's where we had some uh, uh, bone loss, or she had bone loss. But this is what we got to do. Okay? I know I'm going uh, long here on some time, so if you guys have to stop me, let me know. Because I need, there's always so much to show. But this is the way it looks. I just want to go over it again. That's the incision we planned. One dot, two dots, okay? You move, you move the dot over. Okay, that's when it swings down like this. That means, okay, coronally, like that, all right? And that means we have primary closure the whole time. There's never something that opens. So to account for the volume, all right, we want to keep primary closure. And this is the way it's going to happen, okay, by making these incisions. So incision design is a whole different topic, but you need to know this also. Now, listen, if I learn this, you guys can definitely learn this, okay? My name is Mikey, and, and like I said, all these great surgeons and periodontists, all these guys taught me this stuff, and, and I learned a lot from them, and you need to learn the same way, okay? You can't do this just by, you know, doing it on your own. You need to be trained. All right, so this is the way that case looked, okay? Guide pin. I knew there was a, a thin buckle plate, okay? A thin buckle plate. What does thin mean? That means there's no blood. No plumbing, it doesn't heal. Okay, you need blood for it to heal. Look at the right side also how the, the canine eminence of the root, the root eminence is coming through. That happens as we get older, right? We get root uh, buckle plate resorption. So at the same time, I'm going to add to all this. Okay, perforation of the plate, it's key. When you're going to add an onlay graft, you have to perforate the plate called decortication, all right? You have to make little holes in the plate. That's how basic it is. Now, Carl Mays called it the wrap phenomenon, okay? Wrap, I forgot. I forgot what rap phenomenon meant already. <laughs> okay, but it's called the rap phenomenon. Okay, oh, well, rapid accelerating process. That's it. And what happens is, you know, once you create these blood sites or these bleeding sites and you add in your graft, you're going to get all, and PRF, uh, you're going to get all this angiogenesis, all the great growth factors in there. It's just, it's just a stunk. You're going to do great. And you have to learn this little by little. But this is it. It's perforation of the buckle plate. Now, this may look like, oh, it's a problem. But I knew this was going to happen. I knew I was going there. This was my plan. It's either that or I'm going to add a bone graft and have to see her again six months later and then do my implant. But I knew that I was able to do this with a positive outcome and something that I've been reproducing all the time because I was trained from the literature. So now we go forward. Remember, all this was expected. 
So none of this was a surprise to me as I went into the procedure. And this is what you need to know. So let's review the steps, okay, of this case presentation. And then the rest will be fast here. So patient comes in, a 10 millimeter screw, denting screw. Incision design, key, okay? You need to know about your incision. Implant placement, okay, where it's going to be placed, ideally, for the restorative, always from a prosthetic standpoint or viewpoint. Bone graft, all right, that's a whole different lecture now. Which kind of bone are you going to use? Are you going to use uh, autogenous, uh, allograft, uh, you're going to use xenograft? Okay, that's a whole different lecture, but this is about PRF, all right? What do I like to use? I like to use uh, osteogen, osteogen, basically synthetic, okay? Not xenograft, that's alloplast. So, and that's our PRF. That PRF is just going to go all over the place because that's just the fertilizer to our soil. All right? And this is the way the sutures look afterwards. Now, you're going to come across people, and everybody, look, remember this. I, I was, I was taught, taught this in a peri residency, okay? I was taught that, you know, for every, and I always remember this, all right? Uh, Dr. April, I mean, uh, April Capetta, Rutgers Perio. He said that uh, for every, for everything that they say you can do, there's always 50% that says you can't do. Okay, so they told me I, I you know, I've been trained, and they told me I have to use um, synthetic, synthetic, uh, not synthetic, ah, PTFE uh, sutures. Okay, you know what? I don't have PTFE sutures when I was in Dominican Republic uh, courses out there. I just use silk or vinyl. So I use vinyl all the time, and. That's what I use different style, obviously. So you do what is best for you and what you like to buy. I'm not going to go spend money on something like PTF sutures, PTFE sutures. But this is four days later. Okay, that's my vital sutures. Right? That's the way it looks four days later after using PRF. Okay? Look at that. That's seven weeks later. Now you're thinking like, wow, he could have done better with the bone grafting. Maybe he could have a little more height. Now remember, whenever you're going to have uh, add bone, a ridge augmentation like this, it's very difficult to get height, okay, to get height of the ridge. You can get width, but you got to get height. So this is going to be a soft tissue procedure afterwards, but you're going to take a look at it and see what the outcome is. Once again, PRF consists of what? Remember, it's very basic. You got to draw the blood, you squeeze the blood, you get the, the uh, membrane, you hydrate the bone. We used to hydrate bone beforehand with saline solution. Today we, then we hydrated it with blood. Today we hydrate it with PRF, okay? So it's just going forward. Once again, through, I'm not going to stop repeating this. 3D, uh, 3D mesh membrane, okay? That's the matrix. All right? Incorporates platelets, leukocytes, macrophages, all the good stuff from blood, cytokines. Remember I told you that? Matrix, leukocytes, cytokines. Those are the three basic things you always have to know about this, okay? That's all you have to know. I threw in this little prosthetic because this is back in 2015. I use a lot of uh, digital stuff today. But this is the way it looks. This is the way it looked when I was going to restore it. You see the soft tissue and the keratinized tissue there? We had to build up the volume. Now, if you look at it, the zenith looks like if it's a little too apical. Well, slowly, okay? You have to be patient with soft tissue. Yeah, sure. I probably would have used his Arconia uh, abutment today. You know, yeah, definitely. All right, and I'm just showing you. I'm not showing you I was the best there. Definitely today I would do better. Okay, but you see that coping? <laughs> Look at the coping. Even though it was fabricated back then, I remember it was digitally. It just didn't work. Somehow it came back distorted. So don't don't trust the computer. Remember that you have to do. You have to always check it not yourself. So it was open. So if I would have inserted that. Okay, it would have failed. It would have collected bacteria, something would have gone wrong, and then somebody would have laid my implant, something would have gone wrong. So you have to check your stuff on everything. That's why uh, a course that incorporates prosthetics, surgical, perio, okay, uh, biomaterials, all that has to come into play. And Keanu asked me beforehand, how did I get motivated to do all this? It just comes like a puzzle. You keep on building, 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 building until you become a person. Okay, let's go over this case. Initial visit, she came in this way. I remember, I was a fourth dentist. She had a tenting screw. 18 months later, it was post-op. All right, that's the way she looked post-op 18 months later. Look at the crown. That wasn't too bad. Right? I think it looks pretty good. Okay, that's the way the implant looks on the inside. Now, 
there's always going to be somebody that says, oh, but look, you got bone resorption, you have a, you, know, you have bone loss there, it came from the platform. Yeah, but, you know, when people say things like that, just say, okay. I always say, it's okay, you know, and aesthetically, it looks good. But they said, of course, it's going to fail, give it two years, watch, you'll see how it looks in two years. So she came back a month ago, all right, and a month ago, that's five years post-op, post-loading, all right, and that's the way it looks. All right, it's number 10, her left side, her left side, all right, and that's not bad. Now, she never fixed the other teeth like I wanted to, but what could I do? All she wants is that tooth fixed, she wanted it back, and we gave her what she wanted, and we got the best result possible. So, PRF, PRF, PRF. So, I took a picture of the x-rays. If you can look at the radiographs on top, it says 2017. That was two years after we placed the implant of the post-loading. And then we did another one in 2018, and then the x-ray in 2020. Now, a lot of times, uh, people tell you, oh, look at all the bone loss. Look at my first slide. All the bone loss there, you have already to the second or third thread. And then they look in the middle image. Oh, my gosh, look, you're getting some kind of a, a PAP here, and you got more bone loss. And then on the third slide, look oh look it's up to the first thread i got bone growth no it's all about the angle of the x-ray that's all it, it's but aesthetically it looks great okay uh soccer preservation this is the second case i'm gonna go quickly because i'm running out of time and i know kiana's gonna yell at me patient just came in this was two weeks ago patient came in with tooth number four okay same procedure again extraction what do i do i do immediate placement all the time the research shows immediate placement is fine but you have to prepare the socket you can't just pull a tooth out and graft it you have to remove the lamella, lamella layer, layer sorry okay and clean out that all that soft tissue that's in there all right even if it's a healthy tooth there's still some pdl fibers inside i like using osteogen plugs okay osteogen plugs not osteogen um osteogen plugs okay not collar plugs, not collar tape, it's osteogen plugs, okay, because it has bone in, uh, in, you know, impregnated in it. So, but I'm just showing you how the osteogen plug fits in there, but I hydrate later on with PRF. So I just do PRF all the time, but I didn't take pictures at this time. Since I want to save the buckle plate, I make sure the bone is on the buckle side before I place it in my implant. Then I place my implant and I add bone all around the place. This implant here does not have a cover screw, it has a healing collar. Okay, because I'm expecting all the tissue to heal around it. This is the way it looks on the inside. Yeah, I'm writing the sinus. Now, some people are going to say, oh, yeah, well, how does the CAT scan look? You know, the CAT scan, when I looked at it, I did not perforate the sinus. It was actually pressure pushing the sinus away. And that's the way it looks in a cross, uh, in a cross cut. Now, some people are going to look at this. Oh, look at the space you have on the apice of the implant. You know, it's not, it's, that's where the root used to be. Okay, and it's clean. I cleaned it out uh, mechanically, and it was It's fine. 3 o'clock. Oops, the timer's almost going. But look at all that thick, that thick buckle plate I'm going to have. That's Doc, key. Take your, that... uh, take your time, please. Feel free to use it. Oh, that. okay. Rush? Okay, good. I hope it's informative. Is it okay? It's, uh, we, are, we have already had over 400 shares. Everybody loves your stuff. Keep on uh, going. Take your time, and uh, let us learn together. All right, all right, great. So this video here is, uh, I can tell you as much as possible. I can show you slides, but the video will show you uh, what we do and what you need to do with PRF. Okay, so um, this is a case here. Take a look at it. Okay. Remember about the periosteal release. Okay, tension free. Okay. Look at my we incision. Did incision it is. Here and we did papilla sparing incisions, and we go out and we do a reverse C. Okay, with cutbacks back here. I know that you read in your books that they should be very wide, but there's not one research that shows that this causes failure. Okay, that's key. All right, every single person uh, tells me that, oh, it has to be a wide base. That's what we were taught in school. And it makes sense. Let's get a wide base to get the blood in, and everything is going to, you know, uh, heal better. But, you know, if you're going to advance tissue, Right, and if you, if those of you who have done a lot of cases, when you advance tissue and you have that wide base, and you try to advance it, it doesn't work out right. Okay, the tissues don't meet. So what happens now is you have to make the base and do the uh, oblique cuts that come in so you can advance it properly. It's going to be a narrower base, but it heals. It's okay. There's not one article that says there's going to be some kind of necrosis there. 
Oops, sorry. Okay, it's a suggestion. And why? Because I've done over a thousand surgeries with 100% success. Next, when you go through here, maybe 98%, okay? Not 100, maybe 98. Remember, we're going to do an onlay graft. When we do an onlay graft, obviously increasing the volume, okay? When we're increasing the volume, I don't want so much tightness on here. Cannot have this tight. So what I'll do is I gotta release the periosteum. So we'll come over here, and before we even do the grab, we'll just kind of release the periosteum. See this tight? Now the reason why I'm gonna release the periosteum before I do the graft is because when you release the periosteum, you're gonna get bleeding. When you get all this heme in the way, it makes it for a messy surgery. So let's release the periosteum first. Then we go and start manipulating the bone and doing all our bone pr uh, procedures. By the time we come back to the soft tissue and to handle soft tissue for closure, it stops bleeding. Off I go, watch. Don't nice be cheap, using the blade. Okay, that's all we need to do. Now the good one. It comes all the way over here. Okay, and obviously, since I'm using PRF, I have all this protecting me, the PRF. What I meant by saying that all this is protecting me, I meant by the leukocytes and the cytokines. Everything's going there that's going to help us heal. And bone graft, all that. So now it's going to have a lot of heme. We have a lot of heme there. And what's going to happen is that while I'm doing my graft, that heme will stop. And we can just switch everything together. You'll see the end result. Appreciate. Oops. What did I do here? I'm going to have to go backwards. All events, don't worry. We have a lot of heme there. And what's going to happen is that while I'm doing my graft, that heme will stop, and we can just switch everything together. You'll see. What I wanted you to appreciate here also, remember I told you about canine, as we get older, we're going to get buccal, okay, uh, resorption. No matter what, the canine eminence is going to come through. Remember in, uh, in dental school, every time they show you a skull, they always show you buccal plate resorption. That's what's going to happen naturally as we get older. So while I'm there fixing area number seven, I can also repair number six with PRF. I already took the liberty over here, and then I uh, already decorticated the area. Okay, so I put some spots there so that you can see that we're going to graft the area. Let's just get that thing up to you so you can see what I'm talking about. You see the little holes here? So that's for the wrap. Decortication is key. To to this. this is the eminence of the root I showed you on the, on the scan. I can show you that I'm going to, this is 15 millimeters deep. Have I know that? That instrument. It's called the Caldron instrument, okay? Remember, I have a patent on that. You'll see it soon. I'm using my trusty Caldron instrument. Remember, this is patent pending, so I already have a patent, so don't even try. All right, so that's where it goes. And you'll see how it goes there, and we'll show you later. Okay, chop. All right. All right. Okay. I use PRF all over the place, but whatever left, I just use it. As thin as possible. Okay, so then uh, let's see if I can just produce. Just because the PRF is covering the whole site doesn't mean that we're getting all these great hormone, I'm sorry, growth factors from it. So remember, my bone graft has PRF in it. Um, I mix it all up. Um, this is a PRF membrane that I'm placing on top of the graft area, even though it's smaller. I mean, I wish I would have had more, but there was no need to because it's all over the place. Okay, now, all of you should do this. This is something you do every day in your practice. We already got most of the plasma in there. And it's going to stay that way. PRF is closed and done. Okay. See? Every day you got to incorporate this. <clears throat> All right, so I'm coming towards the end. The biggest thing about dentistry is that time goes like this, okay? This is me 2000, I'm in the year 2000 when I met my wife, all right? And I can't believe it's already 2020. So that's my wife, that's me. And, you know, after five daughters, you know, we get tend to enjoy things. Listen. No, Elise. 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 that King Kong is here. So we're looking for King Kong. Anybody see King Kong yet? He's over there, run! He's the one holding the camera. Hey. 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 
There's no king, no sign of King Kong. Pops, there's a jaguar. There's a jaguar right there. So this is probably the last video. Ciao. <laughs> yeah, last video, jaguar, okay? So the one thing I'm trying to say is that, you know, we all love dentistry. We all love implant dentistry. We all love giving people smiles, okay? And don't forget that the most important person is you, okay? You have to be happy with what you're doing. That's my wife. And my wife and my kids is you, okay? Or us. That's what we do. I want to thank everybody, okay, at the Global Summit. All this is great stuff. And Keanu, you did a fantastic thing here. And uh, it's great getting, being able to communicate with so many people at once. Uh, during the pandemic, this is my office that I constructed out in West Islip, Long Island. All right. And uh, it's still on the construction. Okay. That's most of it. And uh, it's probably about 90% done. But uh, you guys can always reach out to me at 516. 852-1386. Keanu's a great friend. Pavel's a great friend. Everybody, you know, this is one great group here. And uh, it was really, really an honor and a pleasure to be here uh, with you guys. I know I probably spoke a lot, and um, I hope it was informative for you. Uh, I want you to know that all dentists should be doing what I do. All right? It just gives you a better quality of life and sanity when you go home. You know you do something for me. Thank you very much again. Ciao, everybody. Hey, that was wonderful, Doc. I, uh, not so fast, Dr. Calderon. I got a couple of questions for you. <laughs> Go right ahead. So when, uh, one of the questions on the side, thank you for this wonderful presentation. Um, one of the questions on the side was, um, when do you just put PRF, in one indication would you just use PRF in a sinus graph? Oh, okay. There was research showed on that. And the research showed that you can do P just PRF in a sinus, and it did show that you get bone um, bone formation there. But, okay, like anything else, uh, any fluid, anything that's soft is going to take the shape of its container, right? And the shape of its container is a sinus, which has got a curve like this. We want to maximize our volume in the sinus. We want to create a ball. So the only way you're going to get that is by putting something in there that's going to create some kind of matrix for it to grow into, which is bone. So me, I do not like, I did uh, all PRF on one side once, and I did bone and PRF on the, on the other on a bilateral sinus, and I got more volume with, when I added bone instead of just adding PRF. Some also argue that um, by just putting PRF or PRP, into the sinus that you're actually not forming bone but fibrous tissue what is your point uh, what is your content um, what is your response to that i asked that question i asked that question to joseph chacron and uh and nelson pinto and they said they were doing the research on that and um uh, they didn't know why the uh, stem cell would go into bone formation and then you had the other 50 percent saying no it went to fibrous formation uh so it made sense to me let me just that and add bone. In the research that you're referencing, did they actually go in and take a sample and, and, and saw that it was bone and it wasn't just fibrous tissue looking nice on an x-ray? It was about three years ago with uh, Nelson Pinto. So he would have, it would have been under his name. Nelson, uh, his huge name in the industry, sure. Nelson. Yeah, he's, he's from Latin great. America, correct? Somewhere from Latin yeah. America? Yeah. Very nice. I, believe, uh, I think it's uh, Brazil. Could be Brazilian, yeah. Very, very well versed. Uh, a lot of research coming out of him. So, yes. what is the the effect of age and gender on PRP membranes? Age, gender. I'm not sure what that question means, but that's one of the questions on the side. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, you know, on the PRF membranes. Uh, Basically, age and gender is not going to have anything to do with it. <laughs> They're going to integrate, uh, right? I mean, it's going to become part of you. Right. All integration doesn't matter what gender you are. But there are a few things. It's actually not a bad question. There are a few things you have to think about. Uh, age. If someone is roughly about 20 years old and they're getting a graft, uh, you can expect, obviously, better healing. If someone's 80 years old, uh, you should definitely incorporate PRF because we need help in the... Um, osteoblastic activity because obviously not functioning as well when you're 80 and when you're 20. Uh, gender has nothing to do with it other than when they're going through uh, hormonal changes, all right? Uh, so someone who's going through uh, menopause at that time, 
there may be some kind of hormonal problems there incorporated because they start taking hormones, uh, substitutes, which means that there uh, can be osteopenia going on, uh, all of that as they're getting older. Because women obviously start a hormone balance and more men. Uh, so actually, it's, not a, it's, not, it's not, a, not a bad question. It had to make me go back into my files to think about that, though. <laughs> yes, but uh, ultimately, it's all auto, so you should be able... Um... Yeah, well, it's just a healing time. What is your opinion of natural tissue regeneration with LPRF, natural bone regeneration with LPRF? What is my what? What is your opinion of natural tissue regeneration with LPRF? Natural? It's all natural. I, I don't understand the question. Yes. Uh, let's go to the, okay, I don't understand the question myself, but here's a good yeah. one. Um, so the amount of, uh, Dr. Bath just uh, informed us that the amount of platelets and growth factors also will have an effect on it. And uh, here's a question from Dr. another Dr. Yeah. Shaw. What's that? Is that Manraj Bath? Dr. Manny Bath, yes. Hey. <laughs> Our good friend, Dr. Bath. <laughs> Very kind oh, gentleman. Actually, Dr. Bat uh, has uh, joined us uh, as the on the Regents Board of the Regents Committee of the American Academy of Oral Surgery, and we are very thankful for him. Very knowledgeable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah good guy, good guy. Always, always a fun guy in uh in school. <laughs> We're very happy to have him. And uh, pursuant to our discussion in the green room earlier, uh, 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 would be nice to connect the AID that you're heavily involved with with the AOS. Um, here's a good question from Dr. Shaw. Since PRF provides growth factors for eight to 10 days, what about healing thereafter? What's your take on this? Because some oral surgeons and some specialists say, you know, you have PRP, PRF, there's accelerated healing, and then after three, four days, the show is over and we all move on. Uh, some believe in it, some don't. I personally do. I do practice very much like you do. Um, but tell us, what is your take on, uh, on on that group of people and their contentions? Well, the whole thing about about any kind of uh, wound healing is the first week. We all know this, okay? So it's whatever you do in the first seven to ten days. Um, so we need to add our fertilizer, which is PRF, in, those, in that first week of healing. After that, you know, we're just going to go through our natural healing phase, a natural cycle. Excellent. What is your take on pain management? Do you believe that PRF, PRP uh, improve uh, our patients' uh, pain management uh, scenarios? You know, I find when I use PRF, I, uh, I get a little like, less heat, less swelling. Um, so I like to incorporate the PRF, but when I incorporate some graft material, if I'm only doing PRF for soft tissue uh, procedures, uh, I don't get that much swelling. But if I'm incorporating some kind of uh, allograft, then I always get a little swelling, and it seems to be a little exacerbated with it. But at the end, it all it's all fine. So, what would you say to a, a doctor that wants to get started and doesn't have a clue where to start? Oh gosh, uh, there's so many courses out there. The first step to buy a yeah. centrifuge that wasn't the first step for me. Uh, no, it wasn't. Uh, I think the first step for me was to assist a lot. I was always I didn't mind assisting people and shadowing doctors. Uh, to go see what they were doing and you just need a day to to really be convinced by the way prf works uh, i wouldn't go buy a centrifuge right away yet um i would definitely go and speak to a doctor or someone who's using it somebody you can trust uh someone who's willing to share their knowledge and i do in this the first day and then after that uh take a course take a course that's going to incorporate prf a reputable course not just a course that's uh you know given by a guy up the block <laughs> so uh there's a lot yeah, of guys gotta, up the block. Yeah, you know, unfortunately, you get what you pay for, you know. So, I mean, I remember when I first started out uh, about 20 years ago, I always allotted myself, uh, it's probably wrong to say, but uh, I allotted back 20 years ago, it was $10,000 a year, okay, just for courses. And after my eighth year, 2008, my brother and I looked at each other and we like, okay, uh, we can start our own program now. <laughs> but it takes that long. Okay, You can't become a blue belt by... Uh, just going to a black belt course. You have to start as a white belt. That's true. So a lot of people bring in the alphabet soup, and it gets really confusing for other doctors. 
Um, here's another question you can read and respond to yourself directly. But it's very sad uh, that we have so many different designations for a, a simple concept of blowing, uh, uh, drawing blood and having growth factors and signaling molecules and all of those things facilitate healing at a local site. Uh, it should be, in my opinion, it should be just simplified. PRP, PRF, that's where we are. Those are the concepts. You have you have liquids and gels and and not to complicate things for especially for our younger colleagues that are beginning. You know, ten percent of them are only placing implants, and then you bring in uh, this other thing, and then from that ten percent, uh, who knows how many are actually using PRP PRF? Um, so here's a question down there, and then maybe you can ask another good question that came out. What your opinion is about horizontal centrifuges? centrifuges? First, uh, Dr. Dr. Kotwal, do I do the, the one on the screen? Uh, uh, can you yeah. see that one? Please respond to that question. Is, uh, do we need a, a membrane, what membrane on PRF to break the periosteum to keep it intact? No. Okay. So um, the PRF, the PRF, when you're placing it underneath, once you cut the periosteum and you place the PRF there, it's going to move all over the place like jelly. And it's not, you can't tack PRF down, but you can suture it. You can suture the PRF to the periosteum, you can suture it down. And there's, sur there's suture procedures or, or, or uh, how can I say, techniques to hold that PRF down a little bit and then put the soft tissue over it. Uh, so that's a whole different course on suturing techniques and incision design. So you can't just throw it in and pull the cover over. You have to suture it down. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, There's nothing there's, wrong with going through the PRF with the suture. Okay. What do you say to Dr. Adanki? As you know, we have our viewership is from across the entire world. And uh, um, uh, Dr. Adanki also just came in with a question that I mentioned about horizontal centrifuges. We've been hearing a lot about that out there. Yeah, you know, with the angle and all that, uh, I was reading about that because uh, they get the G-forces involved um, with the angles and the, and the horizontals, so they get the G-forces involved and the way to break it down. It was a good article. Um, like I said beforehand, it doesn't matter on which centrifuge you're using, at least in, uh, in my office, I have four different ones, and I get the same result. Get the same result? Yep. Yep. Um, okay. That's, uh, I, I, I don't, yeah. Come again, Doc? You know, it's be careful with what the companies do. They just try to sell you everything they can. Look, I don't know, Keanu, how many, how many implant kits do you have in your, in your practice? I, uh, I started to get rid of some of them. I only kept four, but there were a lot. <laughs> I, have, I have 11. 11, 11 kits? 11 plus one. 11 implant kits. You know why? Because every company convinced me that they're better than the next. <laughs> yes, that's right. Not only do they convince you, but they come while you're practicing, and uh, they often come unannounced. And if you're trying to hide in the back, and the fastest way to get uh, rid of the situation is to uh, be able uh, be able to just take the kid and say, hey, "I'll see you again," and <laughs> come see me in a couple. Yeah. Of weeks. Yeah. So um, you know what? Eleven kids tells me. That means they got they, they sucked me in ten times. Ten times, yes. But for them, for yeah. implant companies, you know, there's now twelve hundred plus on a worldwide scale, and for them, it's uh, it's actually a very uh, good thing because once they have you hooked on the system, you have to reorder and you have to reorder parts. So all they have right. to do is close you at the beginning, and they're set permanently. And these guys are yeah. all operating against each other. There is no there's no kind of uh, honor system or loyalty. If they yeah, can handle. Give you a free kit. Just give you a free kit. They got you. And <laughs> yeah, that's what they do. That's what they do. It's amazing. I mean, people could just and the young dentists they get they get caught in this all the time. And uh, yeah. I mean, I was there. It happened to me. I'm sure it happened to you. Uh, I still remember a company. I'm not going to say their name because it's a big company. But uh, they came and they sold me a kit and they were giving me all this free stuff. I was like, wow, this is amazing. And what happened was about three months later, uh, that was that system was outdated because they were updating the system. They were just getting rid of all their old stuff. I'm like, oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. So be careful, I guess. Yes, you're absolutely correct. And that's good that we brought that up because we work doctor to doctor. We, we work for the best interest of doctors. These companies, 
uh, 1200 plus is, is too much. And as you stated, ultimately the research and the success of these companies should speak louder than any of their words ever could. So we need to look into research and uh, evidence-based research uh, to see what systems are there are, what connections do you think are better, uh, what, uh, et cetera, et cetera, you know? Think about this, Leonardo. The, uh, what's the difference between 90, 98.7% success on our implants and 98.9? You know, it's, it's one out of 100, right? Titanium is going to take, right? You and I agree on that. Titanium is going to take grade four, grade five. Yeah. Good. Some you know, design like flaws and some implants, yes, I agree. But the, the, sure. the minutest things they make the biggest deals out of is sometimes mind boggling in terms of thread designs and a little bit of angulation of the thread pattern and the pitch and uh and the and the, i mean some of those are important i mean today we are better off yeah. with chemical connections and well, yeah, most important is any kind of surgical procedures not you think about it. just make sure make sure you're not make sure you're not dull <laughs> okay uh your your step drill and uh you should be fine as long as everything is sharp don't create any heat any osteonecrosis, you know, that's going to heal. That's it. That's right. And operator skills are, it's what counts. Not, uh, oh, that's key. not the angle of your that's thread, right. uh, at some distant side inside the bone. Right. <laughs> okay. You gotta be gentle. You gotta be gentle no matter what. <laughs> that's right. Uh, uh, that's right. Glad we, uh, informed our colleagues. And, uh, what is your best recommendation in choosing the right implant system? Um, I would say it should be a reputable company because um, after 15 years of doing implants, oh, well, me, 25 years now, um, you know, you have to have a reputable, reputable company because when you need uh, to buy a part, that company still needs to exist. If it's a new company that's just coming out and they don't have a good reputation, uh, 10 years from now, they, they may not be around and then you're stuck with an implant and no parts. It's like the Lotus. Remember the not the Lotus. It was the 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 car from uh, Back to the Future. Yeah. Ah, uh, you know, if you don't have the parts anymore, what what good is the car? That's right. Yeah. Um, that's what you need. So a reputable company. Reputable company. That's Very good. Wow. That's uh that's right. So Mike, I don't want to take up uh, the rest of your Sunday here. A lot of a lot more of your Sunday with your family and your wonderful five. Uh, 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 a female uh, behind every strong man there's a there's a strong woman and behind mike there's five of them actually six with uh <laughs> there's six of them i commend you on everything you do for uh, uh and everything you have built uh family practice career educator uh, uh motivational speaker we'd love to have you back on the show and also you have helped us a lot with the global summits institute and we thank you for that and uh have a wonderful uh, Sunday. Any final message for our audience? Uh, you know what? I uh, hope to be back. I'll uh, show my cases that fail. That way they know what to avoid. Um, keep strong. Keep diligent. Keep learning. Never stop learning. Remember, even at this age, I can still, I'm still i still learning stuff. Okay? Um, I learned something from a 12-year-old the other day. It was a quote. <laughs> but uh, it's a long quote. And I couldn't believe it. It was a 12-year-old that told me this. Like, wow. That was smart of the kid. <laughs> so yeah. you can all learn. All learn. I agree with you. We can all learn. Uh, uh, listen, so. day, I love you guys. Be safe. Remember, go like this from Dr. Mike. <laughs> Implant <Ooh>. dentistry. <laughs> I'm getting better at it every time, Mikey. All right. Thank you so much, Doc. You got to do the cheek. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. You got it, buddy. Right, buddy. Thanks so much, Mike. Take care. Have a great Thanks, Sunday. Bye-bye.